Greetings to those who watch below. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at some of the most mysterious disappearances that have happened in the world. But before we start, I'd like to say thank you to Steffi Ray, Wicked Witch, Lisa Watts, Lefty Kim, M.A. Way, Julie B, Jess Black Curtain, Christina Groves, LT Punisher 666, Chris BLK Chris, Canopsia, Tegan S, and The Real CFED 22. They are all members of Those Who Dwell Below, an exclusive channel membership that gets you shout outs at the start of every video. If you'd like to join them, check out the link in the description box. Also, I am looking for people to share their stories, ready for a Halloween special of true terrifying subscriber stories. Also, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, hitting the notification bell so that you never miss a video. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Owen Parfit Owen Parfit had lived a wild life by anybody's standards. He told tales of his youth that featured piracy, great battles, and numerous women. Most people were skeptical of his stories, and he undoubtedly knew that, but it never stopped him from recounting his glory days nonetheless. By the 1760s, Owen Parfit was in his 60s, and people said that his wild living had caught up with him. He was now a virtual cripple, living with his elderly sister Susanna in Shepton Mallet, a town in southwest England. For a man used to moving freely from one adventure to another, the paralysis must have come as a heavy burden. He would have one final adventure, though, that would capture the attention of Shepton Mallet and the neighbouring villages. The date is sketchy of the occurrence. Some sources claim the following took place in June of 1763, while others place it five years later in 1768. Regardless, what we do know is that on a warm evening, Owen Parfit wanted to sit outside. Due to his virtual immobility, he needed the assistance of his sister and a neighbour to carry him out into a chair on the front porch. When his sister went back into the house, Owen was sitting plastily in the chair. Across the road, a very short distance away, several farm workers were labouring with an easy earshot of Owen. Certainly, if someone approached him where he sat on the porch, somebody would have seen something, but nobody ever saw a thing. A storm was coming that evening, and so Owen's sister came out onto the porch to bring him back inside. But Owen was no longer in the chair. Knowing that he could not have moved anywhere by himself, she asked the farm workers if they saw someone come get him, but none of them had. Panicking, the sister enlisted the help of the farm workers and neighbours to search the area. It wasn't possible Owen could have left on his own. Impossibly, they never found a trace of the crippled man. Over time, neighbours passed along tales about what had happened to him, including that he'd been taken by the devil, or that pirates had carried him off in order to get him to tell them the location of his buried treasure. Owen's incredible disappearance was never solved, and became a popular piece of local lore. The story would fade over time, but became local news again in 1813, when some routine construction in Shepton Mallet unearthed a human skeleton. Everybody jumped to the conclusion that it must be Owen's remains, and theories were put forward as to how Owen's body had come to such an undignified end. The medical community nipped the gossip in the bud, however, when it stated that the skeleton was that of a young female. He remains one of South West England's most intriguing mysteries. Alfred Beelharts On the 3rd of July 1938, the Beelharts family took advantage of the Independence Day weekend to go camping in Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park. Their four-year-old son, Alfred Edwin Beelharts, was to vanish that day, and to this day, no sign of him has ever turned up. There were several strange reports of Alfred, six miles from the area where he vanished. He was also reported in the company of a mysterious man on a road in the area. The family, together with their father, William Harvey, included ten children and lived on Quebec Street in Denver, Colorado. The Beelharts family, as well as some family friends, 
set up camp roughly a quarter mile west of the Fall River Lodge. It was located just south of the west exit of the current Lawn Lake Trailhead parking lot. The camping party was located near where the Roaring and Fall Rivers met, just below Horseshoe Falls. The family woke bright and early that morning. William Bealhart, Alfred's father, decided to walk to the stream to wash up, and Alfred came along. Oren Bronson and Walter Hansen, friends of the Bealhart's family, had also set out to freshen up roughly 500 feet upstream from where Alfred and William were. William and Alfred finished their wash before Oran and Walter, and William headed back to camp. Alfred walked upstream to follow Oran and Walter once they were finished. Once Oran and Walter returned to camp, the group noticed that Alfred was not with them. He had gone missing between the time William headed back to camp and when Oran and Walter returned. The campers began searching for Alfred immediately. There were over a dozen individuals at the campsite and were convinced that they would find him quickly. He couldn't have gotten far in such a short amount of time. Plus, it would be difficult for Alfred to not hear over a dozen people shouting his name and follow their voices back to safety. But after scouring the area and not finding Alfred, the family became very anxious as to Alfred's whereabouts. When they had no luck, they decided to call in the park service for assistance. The Bealhart's family contacted Ranger Moomaw at the Fall River Ranger Station. Moomaw immediately contacted the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, a work relief program created as part of Roosevelt's New Deal to help with the search effort. Within 45 minutes, over 100 CCC members had arrived to begin searching. On Monday, July the 4th, Independence Day, CCC and other volunteers were still combing the area for any sign of Alfred, and bloodhounds from the Colorado State Prison were brought into the park to help aid the search, but they were unable to find Alfred's scent. The rangers were operating under the assumption that Alfred may have fallen into the nearby Roaring River and drowned, so they decided to dam and divert the river on July the 5th. The search party built a dam with sandbags, rocks and logs and used grappling hooks and pikes to search the riverbed. Despite their efforts, nothing was found in the diverted riverbed, so they erected a wire net near the Fall River in the hopes of catching any evidence. When this returned no results, they gave up searching the river. His parents told the rangers that they were certain he must have been abducted. They knew that their son wouldn't just leave his family and they were sceptical that he had just fallen into the water. By Wednesday, the search of the river had ended, leaving searchers frustrated and confused. They continued to search the land, and by Thursday, 200 searchers told news reporters they were convinced he had never drowned and had either gotten lost in the forest or was kidnapped. The searchers were convinced that if the boy had fallen into the Roaring River, his body could not have passed all five of the beaver dams and reached the Fall River. Even if it had, they said, it could not have passed a wire net set up near the Fall River by workers for the Public Service Company of Colorado. Rangers called in some sniffer dogs from the nearby Colorado State Penitentiary. A human scent was detected, but the hounds came to a halt near the river. Another set of dogs hit on a scent some way higher in elevation from the camp, but led nowhere. The search was eventually called off after 10 days. On Sunday, July the 3rd, William J. Eels, a radio appliance employee from Denver, and his wife were also hiking in the Rocky Mountains National Park. They had made it quite far up the old Fall River Road when they got tired and decided to stop for a rest. While resting at about 1 pm, they decided to look up to Mount Chapin and were shocked to apparently see a young boy sat on a rock in a section of the mountainside known as the Devil's Nest. This was around six miles west of where Alfred Bealhart's had disappeared from. The child was said to have made a shrill noise and walked out to look over the ledge and then either left or was pulled away from the ledge. They decided to hike to the point where they saw him in order to make sure the child was safe, but when they reached the boulder he was perched upon, they found nothing. The pair decided they had to alert someone 
about a child roaming around on the devil's nest. The eels got back to their parked car and heard the news of the missing boy on the radio. Upon returning home, the couple checked the newspaper and confirmed that the photograph of Alfred within it matched the child they'd seen in the devil's nest. They promptly drove back to the park and contacted rangers. However, rangers were sceptical, believing it would have been impossible for Alfred to have made his way up the slope to Devil's Nest. They did eventually send a group of over 150 men to search the area, but they came back empty-handed. On July the 8th, the FBI announced that it was performing forensic tests on a piece of soiled bandage that had been found in an abandoned cabin in the park. The disclosure of this finding was prompted by the insistence of the boy's parents that their son must have been abducted. Apparently, Alfred had a blister on his foot at the time he had vanished, and his mother had bandaged it using similar material. On the same day, a woman by the name of Mrs. C. A. Lynch, who lived in Big Spring, Nebraska, allegedly saw Alfred and a mysterious man walking along a highway together as she and her husband were driving from Big Spring to Ogallala. She didn't know until the next morning how important her sighting was when she was reading the newspaper and saw the photo of Alfred. She claimed the boy she saw on the highway was the same boy and she was adamant it was Alfred. She told her brother-in-law, W.B. Lynch, about her sighting and he then went to speak to a Denver detective sergeant by the name of Fred Renovati two days later on behalf of his sister-in-law. He said she was positive the boy was the one whose picture she saw. On Sunday, November 27, 1938, after Alfred had been missing for five months, his father received a ransom note. The message said, Sorry for your son. We went west. Out of money. The boy doesn't take to us. We will return your son if you leave $500 in a can one block from your house and the note. We will return your son within 24 hours. However, by November 29th, the police were fairly certain that this was a hoax, and the next day they issued a statement to confirm they had investigated two possible suspects. They were never named and were apparently not formally charged. The line of inquiry quickly ended for reasons unknown. No further breaks have ever happened in the Alfred Beelhart's disappearance case. We may never know what happened to that small boy in the Rocky Mountain National Park on the 3rd of July, 1938. Paula Jean Weldon For the most part, disappearances in forests have been attributed to individuals just wandering off to the wrong places and getting into situations where they should not have been. Whether it is them being involved in natural hazards or being devoured by wild animals, very rarely has anyone tried to relate the missing individuals to a common cause. However, sometimes the nature of disappearance and the frequency of them occurring in a place makes people wonder if they really are just the work of nature. In addition, it makes one wonder if foul play is involved. One such set of disappearances have been those that occur in Vermont, in an area that is known as the Bennington Triangle. For decades, dozens of people have gone missing in this area, sensationalized as a hotspot of paranormal and supernatural energy. Stories of Bigfoot, UFOs and serial killers are common in this area, surrounded by Glastonbury Mountain. One such case that was so mysterious that it even inspired a horror novel was that of Paula Jean Weldon. Paula was a college student studying at Bennington College in 1946. She was multi-talented and was interested in things ranging from hiking to playing the guitar. During her time before the disappearance, Paula was going through a depressive episode that her friends took note of. She was sadder than usual and did not go to Thanksgiving back home either. So when she decided to tell her roommate about a hike she was going on on December 1st, 1946, everyone thought it was Paula's way of rejuvenating herself. Little did they know, it would be the last time they ever saw Paula back on campus. Paula Jean Walden has been dubbed the real-life Little Red Riding Hood because of the way she was dressed 
before she left for the hike. She was wearing a red parka jacket with fur, jeans and sneakers. It made little sense for someone to dress this lightly when going for a hike in the winters when snow was imminent. Many speculate that Paula underestimated the change in weather as it was only 10 degrees Celsius when she left. However, soon after, the weather turned harsh, going as low as minus 12 degrees Celsius. The extreme weather was the first thing that might have contributed to her disappearance. But as we will see, it is certainly not the only theory put forward. Worries began to grow when Paula did not return back for her classes the subsequent Monday. Paula's family was notified and a search began. The first area they checked was Everett Cave, as it was a place that Paula had said she'd wanted to hike to. However, when a small team led by a guide reached the cave, Paula was nowhere to be found. In fact, there was zero evidence of any sort that Paula had ever been on that trail. After talking to several people in the area, many told investigators that they had had contact with Paula or a girl who matched a description before she went missing. Some of her college mates also reportedly gave directions to Paula about the long trail she wished to go on. It is reported that Paula decided to start the hike any time after 4pm. By that time though, darkness had begun to descend and the weather was becoming worse. It was a recipe for disaster. After the initial searches yielded no results, Paula's picture was circulated around newspapers. All taxi drivers were informed of the disappearance and the state police of New York and Massachusetts were also notified. However, as there was not a defined area where Paula might have gone, a formal search had still not started. Volunteer searches that involved students from Williams College who were familiar with Paula's hike path went on searches themselves. Once again, there were no signs of Paula at all. Soon enough, the police started getting more involved in the investigation. At one point, over 500 people were searching the area for Paula. Even aircraft were used to direct investigators to areas that were not yet searched. Sadly though, many speculated that the investigation was poorly managed and was extremely inefficient. Even the college professor claimed that there was foul play involved and Paula's body was being concealed. However, the investigator report talked about how the police went above and beyond to find any clue leading to Paula. They even dug up the ground in an extensive area in hopes of finding any remains of her. But it was all to no avail. Paula Weldon had disappeared into thin air. So what happened to Paula? Initially, the theory that comes to mind is that Paula could not continue on her trail due to the harsh weather and was lost in the thick and dense woods, ultimately freezing to death. While this theory is plausible, the utter lack of any evidence at all in the vast search area makes it shaky. An animal attack was deemed nearly impossible as well, as there were no signs of torn clothing, missing shoes or limbs. No blood was found in the area searched as well. In fact, searches that were conducted even after the snow had melted yielded no results. As time went on and people found no answers to where Paula went, wild theories about an alien abduction became increasingly popular. This was backed up by dozens of UFO sightings in the area where Paula went missing, leading many to believe that there was a different type of natural at play, the supernatural. To this day, the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon remains a mystery. The utter lack of evidence is the main reason why many consider this case to be so baffling. That, coupled with the sensationalized supernatural theories that inspired the novel Hangersman, has led people to be fascinated by this case to this day. James Tetford Paula Jean Weldon is far from the only person to have gone missing in the Bennington Triangle. James Tetford has also disappeared in the region. James Tetford was born around 1884 in Vermont. Not much is known about his early life, but by 1940 he was a resident in Fletchertown, Franklin, Vermont, with his younger wife Pearl, who was 28 at the time, and he was 56. 
things started to get strange following Tetford's return to Vermont at the end of his second spell of military service at the end of World War II. He returned to find his wife Pearl had vanished. No trace of her could be found. The property they rented in Fletchtown had been left abandoned. Tetford's family claimed no knowledge of the whereabouts of his missing wife. They said they had last seen her as she was heading to the Amoco store in Franklin, but they never saw her again. One day, Tedford was on his way home to the retirement home he lived in in Bennington from a trip to see family in St Albans. The scheduled bus trip should have taken the best part of eight hours, but heavy snow caused a long delay. The route also passed through the Green Mountain National Forest, an area renowned for disappearances and strange events during the 1940s. Tedford was seen sitting on the bus by 14 other passengers. They all testified to seeing him there, sleeping in his seat. When the bus reached its destination, however, Tedford was gone, and the driver and other witnesses all testified that they had not seen the man leave the bus. Tedford was seen getting on the bus in St Albans by multiple witnesses, and was still seen on the bus at the stop before arriving in Bennington. Somewhere between this previous stop and Bennington, Tedford vanished. Strangely, all his belongings were still on the luggage rack, and a local bus timetable lay open on his empty seat. Tedford was never seen or heard from ever again, leaving only a mystery in his wake. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video, I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like, as that really really helps out the channel. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe, making sure you hit that notification bell so that you never miss a video. So, until next time, sleep tight.